Alright guys, we're Royal Rustler here, and today I'm going to be reviewing Stream World 2016. Uh, I've just finished, well, well, wait a minute. I got up at 6 o'clock to watch the show. I watched pretty much all of it, but I had to skip the women's match because my internet connection was abysmal. So uh, I got home from college, I watched it, and I'll tell you about it, obviously, when I get to it. But um, I do have to say, I haven't watched the pre-show, I haven't seen Baron Corbin against Dolph Ziggler. Apparently that match was pretty bad. From what I'm hearing, apparently he got one and a half star in Fallen One Mania. So, um, yeah, I mean, my friend, I, I haven't talked to him about the pay-per-view yet. So, um, he'll be seeing my thoughts on here. Um, but, I I mean, I don't know. I mean, it's Ziggler and Corbin, I expect a little bit better. But um, my prediction was correct. Ziggler, uh, Corbin went over. End of days. Apparently, it was also not much of a DQ match. No DQ match because there was no cheers or anything. There was only a low blow. Which I guess is nice, but because uh, it at least doesn't glorify the use of weapons so that it doesn't seem special in the Extreme Rules match later on, protecting Reigns' match. Um, but, you know, it, they should have had at least a weapon used, surely. But um, I can't tell you how good it, the match is. I haven't seen it. So I'm just going to have to do what I do with all pre-show matches. I got the prediction right. That's it. So anyway, moving on to the main card, we have the opener being Gallows and Anderson against the Usos in the Texas Tornado Tag Match. Now, I actually thought this was a very, very good choice for the opener. I think this one worked very well. It was very fast-paced. Gallows and Anderson were extremely good. I think this is the best match they've had since they've been in the company. They looked very good. They beat the uh, former two-time WWE Tag Team Champions in convincing fashion, but it was still a very... Um, solid is in terms of it was a great bout in terms of action and diverse offense and stuff. So Gallows and Anderson didn't dominate, but they were put in a great performance here. The Usos were very good. There was a lot of super kicks. You could say it was a super kick party, as I'm sure JBL was eager to say. Um, as much as he was eager to say, Ambrose just does stuff in the Asylum match. But over in the end, uh, it took a magic killer to beat uh, the Usos. Gallows also hit a Gallows pole, and I thought Carl Anderson was going to hit a stun gun at one point, which he didn't. He just hit a spine muster, which kind of made me sad. When Gallows hit the Gallows pole, that isn't really a Gallows pole. That's just a sit-out choke bomb. The Gallows pole is sort of a reverse full Nelson. Yeah? WWE wrestling there for you. Yeah. But, um... Decent matchup. The Magic Killer, they called it the Magic Killer again, so we're sticking with it, even though we can't have Calf Killer. Um, two and three quarter stars. I thought this was a decent matchup, a good way to start the show, and the best showing from Gallows and Anderson since they came to the WWE. Then we had the United States title match, and I don't know why I picked Kalisto to win this. Uh, when I thought about it seriously after I predicted it, I was like, damn, Rusev's going to win. And that makes total sense, because Rusev's going to win, he's going to take the belt to Memorial Day, and lose to Cena, because Cena's going to have to build the belt back up, which is a good thing, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But um, Kalisto against Rusev, this was a good matchup. The only thing to me that really stuck out, it was a good match, but there wasn't much that stuck out. Kalisto was very athletic, very talented. I think he was wearing the Hayabusa colours again. Nice little homage there to one of the greats. But um, there isn't much that sticks out. Lana's outfit sticks out. Uh, there's an idea for you. Um, but um, there isn't too many spots that stick out. The one big one, which I'm, people are probably going to talk about, is the... The back bump on the apron that Kalisto takes. Now, it's not that dangerous of a bump. Saying that as somebody who isn't a wrestler, it's not necessarily that dangerous of a bump. You'll see guys on the indie circuit take it very regularly. And this isn't me glorifying the bump. This is me saying it's a dangerous bump, but it's not that dangerous. Although, Kalisto's selling made it seem that dangerous. So I do want to give him a lot of props. And then, I mean, if it was... An injury, a definite injury, they wouldn't have had Rusev put the accolade on so quickly. So when Kalisto uh, did it, and his selling was just excellent. So uh, after that, Rusev pulls Kalisto in the ring, locks him in the accolade, but it's the best accolade I've ever seen, because he wrenches it back, and Kalisto's back is bent all over like that, and it is brilliant. A great finish to the matchup. It shows that Kalisto wasn't just beaten, he was tortured into submission by the Bulgarian brute Rusev, and uh, Rusev and Lana back together with the US title. Oh, deja vu. I hope I, I hope it's a good run, but I do see Cena just taking it on Memorial Day. 
And um, I do want to get into why I think Cena taking the belt back is a good thing. One, I believe that means he ties Ric Flair for United States title reigns. So, there's one. I just thought of that off the top of my head very quickly. Um, two, I think that if um, Cena wins that belt back, he can bring some prestige back to that title. Because that title has lost all the prestige it had when Cena built it up. And when he finally lost it, we felt like the person that beat him would get that, that rub. It was Del Rio... He didn't need the rub, but they gave it to him anyway. And then, of course, Kalisto's done very little with it, although he's had some good matches with Del Rio and Ryback. He's done very little with it. And Cena getting the belt back is the right thing. And finally, the last reason Cena holding the US belt is a good thing, it means he's not in the world title picture. It means that Rollins and Reigns and Ambrose and Lesnar and Owens, maybe, can have that world title picture to themselves and let Cena build up the US belt to finally drop it to say Shinsuke Nakamura cough. So um, a good matchup though between Rusev and Kalisto, I gave it three stars. So that's a two and three quarter star and three star match. So a good way, a good start to the show. I do think this is one of the best. I'll say that at the end. Next up we had the New Day against the Vaude Villains and an interesting uh, switch to this match, Xavier Woods wrestled and Xavier Woods doesn't wrestle much. And um, that's a bad thing, because he's quite talented. I don't think he's as talented as Kofi, but he's definitely uh, fairly talented. Um, so, I mean, it was a good thing. It was good to see Woods. He did some good action. He was a good babyface in peril. He got the big tag to Big E, which was a nice touch. And um, a good match. A good match. There was very little outside of a really good spot where Xavier kicked out of the whirling dervish, which was a really good near-fall spot, because... Um, as an NXT fan, I'm used to seeing the Whirling Dervish put most of uh, the opponents away, which um, obviously didn't transition well because the crowd didn't quite get it. So they've seen the Whirling Dervish, but they maybe didn't understand the finisher or something. Needed that. But um, a good matchup. In the end, Kofi kicks Simon Gotch in the head, and then uh, Xavier gives him a shining wizard for the win. So um, a good match, you know, that's... A good match, three stars. Sorry, I'm a little bit flustered. I don't know why. A good match, three stars. So two, three-quarter star match. A three-star match and a three-star match. We're actually getting better. I do think the match has got progressively better, actually, at this point. And then they jumped in uh, ability to the fatal four-way match for the Intercontinental title between The Miz, Sami Zayn, Kevin Owens, and Cesaro. This match was unbelievably good. This was the best fatal four-way I've ever seen in my entire life. Morley Man matches are very hard to do, and it's very easy for me to say that if this matchup was just Zayn against Cesaro, or Zayn against Owens, or Owens against Cesaro, it would be better than the Fatal 4-Way Stip. However, after watching this Fatal 4-Way matchup, I'm having second thoughts, because this was an unbelievably fantastic Fatal 4-Way. As I've said, it's the best Fatal 4-Way match I think I've ever seen in wrestling, and I'm generally being serious. The Miz... Zayn, Owens and Cesaro worked perfectly together. There was great spots and everybody got their moment. The one second halluva kick from Zayn where the bell rings and Zayn just runs and halluva kicks Owens and he just falls out of the ring was excellent. That was such a good spot. And then Cesaro runs and uppercuts Miz, another good spot. And then you just had this really nice harken back to the NXT days where it's Zayn against Cesaro and you just thought about a rival and the two out of three fours match. That was great stuff. Uh, Miz coming in, being really sneaky, trying to steal pins was just great, and it's great for his heel character. Maurice got involved very little, which was also good, because I felt like it might take away from the match a little bit. Owens came close with a pop-up powerbomb. Miz came close with a score-crushing finale. Cesaro hit a neutralizer. Zayn hit a halluva kick. In the end, the halluva... Cesaro, I've got to talk about Cesaro, Cesaro was a beast. Cesaro was a 100% beast in this matchup that took everything. He took a pop-up powerbomb, he took a halluva kick, and he took a score-crushing finale. But in the end, it was her halluva kick from Sami Zayn that put Cesaro out when uh, Zayn was pulled out of the ring by Owens and Miz just crawls in and uh, covers Cesaro. Miz is still the Intercontinental Champion. Owens and Zayn were fighting outside of the ring, which means we are going to get exactly what I thought. That feud will continue until SummerSlam, and we will have them both in the Money in the Bank ladder match, probably, along with Cesaro, who at my at this moment, to me, is probably the winner. I think Cesaro could win the Money in the Bank, and I genuinely feel that, and that makes me so happy, because do you remember when I did my book the next year of WWE? Cesaro won my Money in the Bank. Um, but as far as the match goes, four and a half stars. 
This is a great match. You need to watch this match. If you if you like multi man fatal four ways, which I don't know why you would, but um if you like fatal four ways, it's the best fatal four I've ever seen. Un unbelievable fatal four way. Really fantastic stuff. Uh, after the Fatal 4-Way, it was the Asylum match between Ambrose and Jericho, and I thought this was a good match. I've seen people kind of crap on this a bit, and um, I felt like this was a good match. It wasn't great. It wasn't, you know, amazing or anything. It was a good match. They used the weapons well, and I think the reason I think it was a good match, and I'm going to give it three stars, is because they used the 2x4 in barbed wire, and they used the tax because the tax and the barbed wire aren't necessarily PG. And it was nice to see them get used, which does make me wonder why they wouldn't use them at Mania. But um, I digress, that's the pass down that's happened. But this was a good match. Three stars in the end, Ambrose dropping Jericho onto the tax after Jericho goes for a codebreaker, then giving him the dirty deeds. Jericho, with all the tax in him, was a brilliant spot. That was great for the. That, that's this new era's sort of introduction to sort of extreme hardcore wrestling because obviously my introduction was really Orton getting dropped in the tax when he goes for the RKO. That was my extreme introduction. This new generation, that's their introduction and it's a good introduction. So, um, good match. There's no real faults outside of the the, the, the gimmicky mop and the, the strap really but um, I do wish the plant pot had been involved in the finish because you can wrap a nice story up with a nice weapon finish. Ask uh, James Storm and Bobby Roode, they know something about that. Definitely. Uh, you can ask Bobby Roode, actually. He works for the company now, apparently. So, But um, a good match, three stars. So if you look at the show, I just want to say this quickly. Two and three quarter star opener. Three star, three star, four and a half star, and three star. That's a really good show, then, so far. And we move on to the women's match. And um, for the women's title, Natalia against Charlotte and... Uh, I thought this was okay. I don't know if they know how to do a submission match yet, and that's because they are amateurs as far as submission matches go. Now, if they've done them on the indies, that's great, but doing it on a higher level is a totally different ball game. Um, if you look at some of the best submission experts, like Chris Benoit, Kurt Angle, Bret Hart, then you have guys who know how to make submissions draw in effect from the crowd, and they know how to get emotion out of the crowd. Even a guy like Styles, uh, Tanahashi, they know how to get... Um, emotion out of the crowd. These two women really don't, and you could tell that the crowd had very little interest in this. There was no close falls because it's a submission match, and you know it has to end by submission. So when Charlotte does a big power bomb, she can't pin her. There's no near fall there. And I'm a big fan of submission matches as a fan of Benoit, Angle, Eddie Guerrero, AJ Styles. So um, I'm used to watching submission matches, but this is one of the weak ones I've ever seen. It's not bad, and I was going to give it two and three quarter stars after it finished, or just before it finished. And then Ric Flair's music music hit after when Natalia had Charlotte and the Sharpshooter, and my my I was just like, oh great, what are they going to do? And you see him walking out backwards, and you're like, who is that? And you're thinking, that's not big enough to be Ric Flair, even though you can tell from the stature. Uh, the person's quite big. So when the person turns around, it's Dana Brooke looking insanely hot. Now, Dana Brooke is insanely hot, but why would she help Charlotte? Because what happens is Dana Brooke comes out, distracts Natalia, and Natalia taps out to the figure eight. Now, firstly, I believe that's the first time Natalia's ever tapped out, which is a nice little nice little thing for you WWE quizzes out there. But um, why would Dana Brooke help Charlotte? Dana Brooke and Charlotte had a rivalry in NXT um, a while ago. Like around August last year, so why would uh why would they do that? I did still WWE. I don't ask for logic anymore. But um, a dumb finish to a match up. Even though I'm gonna say again, Dana Brooke did look pretty hot. Um, but I do want to say this though. Dana Brooke is hot, and she's a gifted athlete, and you can tell looking at her. She's won Arnold Classics years years in a row and stuff. But um, she is. A lot of people have put it, and this is what I've read, green as goose shit, and that's a very good way to describe her, because she's definitely not the best worker in NXT, she wasn't the worst, Eva, I'm looking at you, but I feel like Dana needs a lot of carrying, and a lot of carrying, I mean, she's probably the, st after watching Nia Jax against Bailey, 
Nia Jax has improved loads, and you can tell that. Uh, the Nia Jax Bailey match on NXT this week, by the way, well last week was really good. Uh, you should check it out if you haven't. But um, best match in NXT since Joe and Zayn. And um, Nia Jax to me now, I think, has more ring presence than Dana Brooke. I think she has a better promo st uh, style. And um, Dana just, I love her to death, but definitely not right to bring her to the main roster. And now she is being positioned as the second biggest heel in the women's division. Not Sasha Banks. Not even Nikki Bella, not even Paige. Dana Brooke. I would say that Nikki Bella and Paige are far superior to Dana Brooke. And I am a big critic of both. So, you know it's sincere. But um, in the end, I'm going to give the match two and a half stars. I don't want to make this a bashing, uh, 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 you know, session on Dana Brooke. But um, it's not the right move at the moment. They should have left her a bit. I, I, I feel like maybe Emma would have taken that spot. Which would have been much better. Emma is far superior to Dana Brooke. In both ways. But um, yeah, Dana Brooke definitely isn't ready for the main roster. And she's definitely not ready to be the number two heel. But um, in the end, I'm going to give that match two and a half stars. It would have been two and three quarters. But the ending just... I thought the ending was horrendously stupid. So main event time. Roman Reigns against AJ Styles. Extreme Rules match for the WWE World Heavyweight Championship. This was a great match. This was better than their payback match. This had some great spots. They fought in the crowd for a bit. AJ took a back body drop through the table that he could not control. So basically, when you do back body drops, by the way, guys, you need to take flat back bumps. AJ twizzles and stuff and lands on his, like, lands on his butt and it just doesn't look right. But it does look cool at the same time. It looks like it's going to hurt more. But uh, it does look cool at the same time. AJ also got powerbombed through the announce table. He took one of the, the best spot of the match had to be. Where Reigns catches AJ in a powerbomb. Lets him fall down. And just smashes him against the ring apron. He did it against the barricade as well. But the camera angle showed that AJ basically hit it with his hand. But when it does it against the ring apron. You can hear this crack. And it's just so satisfying. Uh, Reigns then went to spear AJ through the barricade and missed and went through it himself. AJ gave Reigns a Styles Clash for a great two count. Uh, Gallows and Anderson came out when uh, Reigns Superman punched AJ. Awesome spot there. AJ went for a phenomenal forearm. AJ, uh, Reigns gave him a Superman punch and AJ bounced on the ropes for a second and then fell. That was an amazing sell. That sell needs a lot of credit because he had to balance first. And then fall safely, and he did it very well, and he sold the punch well. Um, AJ hit a Styles Clash on a chair, which Reigns, um, one of the Usos, pulled him out of the ring very quickly, and he just kicked him away and got the cover 1 2, kick out by Reigns. So there is at least a reason why Reigns kicked out of the steel chair. Styles Clash. Um, but in. Oh, they. Uh, Reigns also kicked out of a boot of doom when Anderson and Gallows came out and then the Usos came out and there were super kicks and stuff. I thought this like th those guys really helped this match a lot, to be honest. Um, and it definitely worked well considering the first match uh, where Gallows and Anderson injured the Usos a lot. So um, uh, The ending came when Styles went for another phenomenal forearm and Reigns caught him with a spear. Uh, a spear, not a spear. A spear, not a spear. That's a forearm. But um, caught with a spear, one, two, three, Roman Reigns retains four and a half stars. This was a great main event. The best main event WWE have had all year. And uh, the best main event ever pay-per-view last year, I think. Oh, it wasn't as good as the ladder match with Ambrose and Rollins. And um, Rey at the end of the day, at the end of the, the show, Reigns is there holding up his belt. And who do you see come out but Seth? Rollins. And all I wrote in my notes was Rollins in capital letters. Um... Damn, Seth Rollins is back. He came out, pedigreed Roman Reigns, picked up the belt. I assume at Money in the Bank we're going to get Rollins and Reigns. That works perfectly. We can have uh, Rollins then face, I don't know, anyone at SummerSlam. They could do the triple threat at SummerSlam if they really wanted to. Um, they've got a lot of possibilities with these guys coming back. So um, I'm looking forward to the future. I'm looking forward to Raw tonight. And uh, what a great pay-per-view. In the end, for pay-per-view quality, I think... Because the main event was great and I loved it so much, and the four-way was excellent. Four and a half stars. The only real disappointment was the women, and I feel like that's more Dana Brooke's fault. And um, again, I don't want to bash Dana Brooke too much, but um, yeah, she deserves it. 
But anyway, thanks for watching, guys. In the end, I'm going to give the show an 8.5 out of 10. I want to give it a 9 so much, but that woman's match just hurts it a little bit. Uh, thanks for watching, guys. This has been Rob Rosslot. Like, comment, and subscribe for more. Uh, I guess, tell me your thoughts. Did you like the show? Did you think the four-way was this fantastic, excellent piece of art like I thought it was? Or did you think it was shocking? Um, did you like the main event? I think the main event was better than the payback one. That's why I gave it four and a half stars instead of four and a quarter. But, um... Finally, thanks for watching guys, this has been Rob Rosslot, like, comment and subscribe for more.